Hello and welcome to Access Chat. I'm delighted that we're joined today by David Barra of We Can Access. David and I have been chatting for some time now, but it's been a while since we caught up. So David, if you would care to introduce yourself and tell us um, what We Can Access is, and, and then maybe we'll go a bit into the, the backstory of how this came to be. Right, so We Can Access is a social media platform that celebrates accessibility. But what we're doing is we're looking at it from a, a, a holistic perspective from the professionals to the carers to the people with the access issues and it's actually talking about access and getting trying to build a community or building a community so that we can find solutions and then we can signpost people to solutions and essentially it's just bringing trying to bring everybody together and then people can find where they need to find support appropriately so okay. that's that's essentially it we're trying to just change social attitudes because it needs to be done it's just not it's not the, the system essentially is broken and it's not economically viable there, there are too many people looking in so many different directions and the flow just doesn't work and a lot of people are afraid to talk about certain things so what we want to try and do is literally break down all of those barriers bring everybody together just as just as we are and find solutions all together and then signpost people to where that where the best solution is for those people so you, essentially you're you're tapping into collective intelligence absolutely uh, and, and and finding a way of, of problem solving from from the from the crowd that is disability inclusive professional inclusive uh and and representative of of, of, of the widest community yeah but with, with without labeling anybody so that for instance at the moment i'm wearing glasses but actually, am I prepared to wear glasses? What's my best option? Because I'm, I'm visually, you know, I've got a problem with my vision. So actually, am I self-conscious? What do I do? You know, like, how do I want to improve my, my vision? Do I go for contact lenses or do I go for glasses? If, I, if I'm hearing impaired, what type of hearing aids do I want? How do I want to improve that? And it's, and it's the real private conversations that people might be afraid to talk about from cult from a cultural perspective from a per personal perspective but we want to encourage people to talk about and then learn from each other that's really what it is it's it's, it's a learning platform and it's a knowledge sharing platform okay. without any judgments so so we all share that love of social media and the fact that it can be a great place to uh exchange knowledge exchange insights it's one of the reasons why we continue to do access chat after five years because every week we learn something new not just from the wonderful people that we interview like yourself but also from the community of people and the the interchange of ideas um as we discuss stuff during the actual twitter chat so totally understand where you're coming from in, in terms of you know people being able to support each other and i particularly like the sort of the social aspect, because I think all too often we look at stuff and we think, oh, well, we can just deploy technology. Technology is the answer to everything. And actually, you know, it's, it's, you know, social and, and personal attitudes that also impact on whether or not that technology is going to be successful and that's, uh, that's, for an that, individual. Yeah. No, and that, that's exactly it. So a few weeks ago on, on a blog we got um a 14 year old boy who's tube fed read a blog for us uh, sorry wrote a blog for us now what's that got to do with accessibility he shared his story about his decision to get the tube in him because he had to get get filled elsewhere it psychologically it helped him because he was going through he was feeling a bit down at the time and he wanted to share his story so from an access perspective psychologically writing that blog enabled him to feel better it enabled him to share his story for other kids they could see it we're, we're getting and we're really really proud of this we, we're getting um a oh what's the lady um a burlesque dancer who is writing about crohn's and, and her issue with crohn's now to look at the lady um when we put up the blog you won't think that she's got a hidden disability but she has so by allow, enabling people to talk about their things from a social perspective people can learn and think okay it's me i can relate to that that's how they found the solution perhaps this is one way that i can find a solution for me or people that i know yeah and it's, it's just building up those communities and signposting so that's we, we want to celebrate who we are as people 
and not hide anymore. Or if you want, don't want to talk about it publicly, you've got a place that you, you can just be without anybody knowing who you are, so to speak. Does that make sense? And then you can find those solutions yourself. That's what we're about. Have you got, has anybody got any other questions? Yeah, sorry, I was muted. Um, the, so it, it is a good, you know, program, but there are a lot of these, including as Neil said, this is what we've been doing on Access Chat. And there's, there's things happening all over the world, which is really good because we need it, especially during these times. I, there was an article that I shared yesterday on LinkedIn, which was pretty chilling of the elder abuse that we're seeing, especially during this uh, pandemic that we're all walking right now. And it continues to show how vulnerable certain populations are and certainly people that are aging into disability. Sometimes I, I find that that is the hardest part. When my daughter was born with Down syndrome, we actually got support. You know, we got community support, we got state support, we got supports to help us. It wasn't perfect, it blah, 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 but at least there were people that would come and help us. Whereas when my father-in-law lost his hearing and became deaf um, at 80, you know, 88, it was like just too bad, you know, and the loneliness and everything else. And now we're isolating our elders appropriately because we do not want them catching the coronavirus. I understand that. But the abuse and some of the things, you know, that that are being said on social media and things like that. So what I'm wondering is how does what you're doing sort of tie into everything else and I shouldn't say everything else I mean of course it's not everything else Dave I know you're in the United Kingdom but how do we support everything that we're all trying to do to make sure that we change the world in the better in, in a better way one way we're doing it just to help you with it is access chat does these chats every single week yeah. for five years telling what's happening in the community talking about it joining you know having very powerful voices join these conversations but what do we do because there isn't just one answer it's got to be all of us coming together and really making it so i was so, just curious how you're collaborating and well, partnering what's happening and and, and, and that, that's that at the moment is that we're running we're running a pilot project with a special needs school and the children are and the, and the, the children have got a, num, a, a very a wide range of, of access slash disabilities so they're actually using our platform as a school project and embedding that within their curriculum so within the english curriculum they've got to learn history maths geography and other bits and pieces and actually they're using our platform in order to learn the curriculum and empower them to in order to create to get their story told but they're using it as a learning source. And then also what they can do is they can then publish their blogs or their, 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 their pieces on there, but that can go towards their own personal development. Their parents can take pride in what they're doing. And then it actually expands the knowledge base. So it's coming from a grassroots background. We've got, we've, there are a couple of other special needs schools as well that we're working with, and they're very, very different. Um, we're working with other communities who are who don't speak out so much, who, whose voices are, are unsung, and we're starting to to work with them to enable empower, enable them to start speaking because there are a lot of communities, particularly where I live, who aren't on social media, who aren't on the on the the normal platforms, and they're a little afraid because there are cultural barriers. So what we the way we're trying to tackle it is just by by working with the communities and finding out what they want and then enabling them to to develop the platform as they want to uh, as they want it for their use does that make sense we we, we we led we've created a template and now we're allowing people to just mold it into the shape that they want it to so, um, david you know you have spent all your career in education so what led you to move into community and especially to to create this platform that supports individuals with disabilities or families what created that moment for you to decide i need to do this okay so i i've i suppose i could say i got undiagnosed dyslexia so that's that i struggled for years um then my father oh good god about 20 25 years ago he got diagnosed with, misdiagnosed with Parkinson's. So I went on that very personal journey of seeing somebody going, 
being diagnosed with a chronic illness, having to come to terms with it and the whole family and those hidden issues. Then I became a special needs teacher and I was on the service delivery side. And then in 2012, I've got two children. My youngest daughter in 2012 got diagnosed with a brain tumor and <coughs> she was critically ill. And the, 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 the choice for us was if she, or we didn't have a choice, if they gave her certain drugs, her chance of survival were that much higher. If they gave her certain drugs, her her she would become more disabled and so she's got she's visually impaired hearing impaired got gross motor skills issues got cognitive issues and although she survived the treatment it's come at a cost my daughter we're looking to change my daughter's school for the fourth time and um and she's still in her primary school she, i've seen the journey that she's gone on my son has gone on um <coughs> and it's all those points of access of acknowledgement that we've had to go through. I then became a university lecturer and saw maybe there was a bit of a disconnect with the research. Fairly recently, my mother-in-law recovered, was reco had open heart surgery and then she had a stroke two days later. And I've seen the path that my father-in-law and my mother, my mother-in-law are on as well. My wife and I have both got a few health issues as well. So the reason for that whole access was because my we've seen the same a lot of the conversations that are very very similar as deborah pointed out a lot quite a few of the conversations are actually going on and they're repeating themselves in different mediums and what we're finding is because we're members of multiple communities the same conversation is going on time and time again and actually certainly within england we're very fortunate we have lots of charities but actually people aren't working necessarily efficiently so what we want to do is we want to essentially connect the dots because we're we have to as parents we have to connect the dots as as, as parents we can see that the, the the trauma that my daughter's gone through that our, our family are on a on 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 a traumatic journey and the community that we belong to the visually impaired the ethnic minority and goodness knows what else we we can see people very much living and breathing this stuff every single day and if by people not acknowledging these issues that includes myself we can see that actually it's it's just very hard and it's actually a, it's a waste of time and resources it, you know it can be far more efficient so if people do have access chats people do listen to these conversations people listen to the stories in the way that they can understand them then actually it's far more efficient and to be honest about it with the sustainable development goals it's actually far more sustainable my taxable income, like I tell everybody, doesn't actually cover my whole family's healthcare costs. My income does not cover it. My daughter's on growth hormones that cost ten thousand pounds a year. Those ten thousand pounds we have to th those growth hormones we have to fight to get. But actually, that's an investment because that's enabling my daughter to grow to develop. But but the health service isn't seeing it that way. They're seeing it as it's a cost. But actually, from a from an access perspective, it's enabling her to grow to access far more stuff. So we're trying to change people's attitudes or at least think about changing people's attitudes on how they view spending money on disability, on accessibility. Glasses are an investment. You wearing glasses, I wear glasses. It looked like, you know, all of us are wearing glasses. If I can't have this, I can't do my job. This is actually an invest, an economic investment in everybody's future. That's where we're trying to get people to think slightly that's our real way. It's just to change those social attitudes. Excellent. So um, I'm really keen to comment and, and, and discuss about this whole sort of cost benefit piece, because I am with you in that I firmly believe that the approach that has been taken towards disability, which is uh, purely seeing provision as a cost is um, not only um, not productive it's actually counterproductive and costing society more because um, what we're doing is we're stepping over a pound to pick up a penny yeah because whilst we're saving on a particular line item on one budget uh, we're not counting the opportunity costs of failing to invest in our people uh, their ability to contribute to society as individuals further down the line as taxpayers etc and I exactly. think that 
that when we um, take this in the context of the time that we're living in right now, where we're looking at you know, a global pandemic, where um, we have people with disabilities who are more likely to be immunocompromised and much more likely to be at risk of dying than most other groups, that ability to spend up front, that, that desire to save money is actually going to be hugely costly. Yeah, no, no. I mean, when my daughter was going through, the, when, when, like, where did the idea come about? Well, actually, when my daughter was going through treatment, she, her immune system was exceptionally low. Yeah? Okay, yeah. fine. So what happened was we had a blown window in our house. We didn't realise that, but actually we had to whack up our heating. Now, our window, to replace a double glazed window, cost £400. That was a cost, but actually, by investing £400, in, into replacing that window, that we reduced the heating costs. We reduced the impact on my daughter's um, immune system. So that actually, the health service had a benefit. That 400 pounds on that window was actually an investment. Getting a cabin was an investment. Your glasses, our glasses, my glasses cost, I don't know what, 250, 300 quid. That's an investment in an economic opportunity. Not only do my glasses provide employment, but they, they, they enable me to be employed as well. Um, I did some work for the British government, for, for the Secretary of State for Communities. And what I, what I, what I learned from that was the, the, the various government departments are looking at their own budgets and they're not looking at the holistic disability accessibility budget. They're not looking at we this, this ourselves. Exactly, yeah. the, 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 we we as, as individuals, uh, 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 economically, we look at our own budget. We look at how much we earn how much do we spend elsewhere but the government's not looking at the whole life journey of people with an access issue they're looking at it from health budget education and actually from a disability perspective they should be looking at the whole person's life journey and yeah. where they should so education well actually education should be a priority because if you don't provide the right education for people with access issues economically they're going to be at disadvantage their communication skills are going to be a disadvantage look at the person's life journey by by in making sure that that pathway is successful, you're actually improving the economic well-being of the country and the nation and making literally everybody richer. That's yeah. what we can access is all about. It's making it literally economically sustainable and creating new jobs, but creating economic opportunities. Yes, it's, it's about holistic cumulative impact. Absolutely. And, and that is not something that happens... Uh, naturally within governments um, and it certainly hasn't happened in, in the UK uh, but the UK is not alone in that um, but that's what's required for societies to move forward and be inclusive and I know Deborah's got uh, wants to come in so I'm going to hand over. Well I th it, the, 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 the conversation went in a different direction than I was expecting and I totally agree with everything you're saying but I, I don't really know where you live David. I know that you live in the UK and uh, one thing that I, I think I'm getting, I agree with everything that's being said but where I'm getting a little confused and it's probably because I'm sitting in the United States but when you use the word accessibility we are, it's often being used in a different way. So you're using it um, in that we all have access issues. We all can have access issues. So, and you're looking at this from the lens of the UK. So is this just for United Kingdom, people no. that live in the United no, Kingdom? I mean, um, is this just for children? No. Uh, I, I'm getting we're just a little bit confused we're, about where the conversation <laughs> The reason for the whole p platform is because my daughter, when my, dad, my father got ill, he was a member of a particular community that was a global community, that they had global access issues. When my daughter got ill, we became a member of a global childhood cancer community. Okay. So all of the issues that we face, every single one of those access issues, work, in, work education. We, we chat to people on a daily basis. We're on a Facebook group, the most amazing my daughter, my daughter had medulloblastoma. It didn't matter what creed, color, religion, where anybody else was in the world, every single one of those people faced exactly the same access issues. How do you get to the hospital? 
what you know like how do you buy a buggy what do you buy where do you work is your marriage in, marriage going down um i i've also done research into the issues of childhood cancer and i've seen in let's say in the states grandparents pick up a huge cost for childhood cancer the, the because of the economic system so when we talk about access we're talking about actually accessing life and enabling people just to be who they are so they can so they can contribute the maximum to society right it doesn't matter totally agree with you and and unfortunately in the u.s too sadly horrifyingly um when people get sick um they they often you know a lot of americans i i heard a statistic the other day it was something really big like four hundred sixty-five thousand um families are forced into bankruptcy and lose their homes because we don't have good medical coverage for all here in the united states but all i'm saying is that one thing, because I totally agree with everything you're saying, and I think there's huge access issues. Once again, I'm very, I'm also very, very concerned about people aging into disabilities. My husband has aged into a very, very significant disability, and it's getting, it's, it's so the thought of me going out and accidentally getting exposed to the coronavirus, for example, um, and I know we've changed the name, but I, I can't keep it in my head, but and, and then if I, Right. And I probably would survive it. I'm pretty healthy, even though I'm over 60, but, but I don't think my husband would. And so I can't bring it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, COVID-19, but, um, but still we're using the word accessibility often in different ways. We're using it. Uh, and, and I'm not criticizing, I'm seeking to understand. And so, um, we use accessibility it's almost like we've misused the word for so long. And often when we're talking about accessibility, we're talking about it from digital inclusion. And it sounds to me like you're uh, really expanding the word, which is probably more appropriate anyway, but you're, you're saying that we are all human beings and sometimes we need access. And when a, when a family gets in trouble for whatever reason or an individual, instead of punishing us, we all need to be included and all of our voices need to be heard. So I'm hearing and I totally agree with what you're saying, but I'm just saying that often the word accessibility is being used primarily for digital inclusion, not as much for built barriers and all the other things that um, you're talking about. So, 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 so the reason why we call it We Can Access is to, again, it's just the journey that my family and, and, and that I've gone on as, as a sibling, I'm going on as a son-in-law and other bits and pieces, is literally seeing the whole access issue everything and, and the impact and ultimately what really concerns me when, when, when I got invited to, to, to speak at a, a, a sustainable development event in, in Finland I got asked well what are you trying to do and I said I'm trying to change the world because economically if we can as Neil pointed out you know if we can change more or less the economic balance it then becomes more economically sustainable you create a different economy you create a different attitude and that means that actually people aren't fighting for, for resources somebody very brightly came up with glasses they created a whole economy and enabled a whole population and nothing think nobody thinks about going and accessing glasses and going to the shop there is no social stigma it's created so many different jobs globally and it's empowered people and so from 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 my perspective as a parent my wife had a very very good career unfortunately when my daughter got diagnosed her her ability to access work was in one of us had to take the financial hit my wife had a master's. She literally was a day away from, or she, she just got a job that she wanted to, and it was amazing. But my job was more flexible. And then my wife has got a few health issues, so she cannot access work because once somebody else it, it has got a, an access issue within our family, I've got a very flexible job. So we're looking at the whole journey of accessibility and that whole culture of, of it, really. That's, that, that, that's what I've had to come to terms with as, as a parent really. Right. right. And, and I understand all the moving parts uh, as a family that's been dramatically impacted as well. I guess the question I might have, maybe, maybe I could ask the question a little differently. Tell me what we can access. Tell me what your website does. Why should people go to it? How should people use it? How should people contribute to it? Because of course, at Access Chat, we agree with everything you're saying. I mean, we're talking about there's so many different moving parts and so many different parts of the community and cultural barriers. And, you know, we're, we talk about SDGs a lot. 
maybe what would be helpful for me and maybe the audience to know is tell us more about what you're trying to, besides changing the world, which we're all trying to do and we applaud, um, would it, why should people be using your website? Do they go on there to read blogs? Do they tell us, tell us how people should use it? So we're, we, we started up properly in January. Yeah. And that's what that was. So what we're doing is we're building up a resource base where people can read on personal stories and learn from them. We're building up a knowledge bank from blogs and a resource base. People who don't want to, the, the chat area is a community sharing anonymously. So if people who don't feel comfortable about talking things on Twitter, on Facebook, and don't want to reveal themselves and just ask those questions or at least read about them. So what they can do is they can go, like we've got somebody who's, I don't know who they are, whose marriage was starting to break down because they had a child who's got special needs. They didn't want to go on Facebook. They didn't want to go on Twitter. They didn't know, they want, want to ask their friends. I know, somebody, I know somebody else who's from an ethnic minority, who's, whose child, who, who, th th their child is 21. They're thinking about an arranged marriage. They can't go to their own community. They're not sure where to ask these questions. They want to pose a question without without any judgment and just go what do people think so essentially it's just it, it's a platform to enable people to ask questions anything from or to build up a community from work to employment to life and to build up a community set of discussions and solutions it's all monitored it's all i mean nothing can get through what we're doing people can't put blogs up the review area when we, 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 the review area isn't just about the physical place or it's not about a specific disability it's about the functionality of the space so the spaces that i'm in at the moment in my in the room that i'm in it's actually um the sound is okay it's not it's not being it's being absorbed now if you think about certain spaces acoustically they're pretty bad so we want people to think about the actual the mechanics of accessibility and think well where mechanically can i go out so really we, we, it's just it's a knowledge sharing platform it's not it's not just a knowledge sharing platform but people don't have to say who they are and then we can signpost people to to other places like access chats like your company like the, like the work that, that that everybody else is doing and literally we're working with other people to say look Talk, talk to us we will work with everybody else we're working with local authorities we'll work with anybody and if somebody says where do i find help go to you know your company this is the best advice where do we go we go to the local authority we go to this charity if i'm in the in england and i'm going over to the states because i because somebody's paid for my daughter who had cancer to go on a, on a nice little trip and she's run out of this medicine what charity can i access where can i go and it's building up a global knowledge base to en enable people. We don't want to take anything away from anybody. We want to build up a community so everybody can signpost. Uh, does that make sense? I hope so. So, uh, and, 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 and David, how, how you keep users protected? Because sometimes uh, right. uh, we know that online anonymity can create some risks. How you make sure that people don't hide uh, behind that to bully others or put it's, us in difficult situations right. so the only the only data that we're collecting and we're just doing this for, for for cleanliness we only want people's if people want to engage in the conversations they it's just an email address and then it's a fictitious fictitious name um nobody can put up any any blogs without it going through us so that's that if people engage in conversations that we're not happy with there's a report button we take it down we've also got um various it it you know it systems and i've forgotten what they are that check for swearing we don't allow any images to go up there's absolutely nothing nobody's allowed to have a peer-to-peer -peer chat everything is absolutely open and the moment somebody says i'm not happy with this we're not even questioning it it gets taken down we've also got moderators because it ultimately irrespective of gdpr and various data protection laws around the the, the globe this is getting built from two parents who have got kids who have got disabilities there's no way in the world are we going to allow anybody to, to, to hurt our kids and, any, and anybody else's we, we know too many vulnerable people We're, if it comes to it we'd pull the website down we'd pull the platform down because we don't want anybody to get hurt we can't we, we it just it just can't it won't happen we're not we're not going to allow it to happen 
uh, does that make sense? So we've got yeah, yeah, it does. any protection. No. No, uh, do, when you were uh, uh, talking about the, um, yourself and your wife and, and access to work, and you, you were referring that you were able to continue to work because of the flexibility of your job, okay? How important is that, not only to you, but to other families, you know, to be able to access or to engage with an organization at work that gives them that flexibility? I would, the brutal reality is, if I couldn't have that flexibility, I would have a breakdown. I wouldn't be economically sustainable. When I, when I, when, when, when I went for my job, the first day, I, 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 this was the thing, I was actually scared of disclosing that my daughter had cancer. And I can remember the interview and I said, my daughter's got cancer, she goes for three monthly treatments, uh, three monthly MRIs. It might turn out that, you know, something comes up and I might have to go off. Well, the first week that I started, my daughter had an MRI scan. I was due to meet my boss. I had to wait around. So I've been there for five years and that, that, that ability that having an employer that, that enables you to have that flexibility is, is invaluable, but economically my bot, my, 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 my company gets, a, I work far more hours because I value my employer and I value what my boss has done for me. And so from an economic perspective, it makes sense to society from a personal perspective, it means that I'm not on antidepressants. It means that I'm not taking sick leave. It means I'm actually functioning well, and my marriage isn't struggling. Um, and all of those knock-on effects that you can't access because you are, you are a carer, they're substantially reduced because I have an employer that allows me to have that flexibility. If you don't have an employer that has that flexibility, what the employer doesn't realize is that actually they're reducing the taxable income those, that P person's not economically as viable. So actually it doesn't make sense. So employers need to celebrate it because actually if we've got more people out, more people who are carers and more people with access issues who are out at work, actually the, ta the, 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 the country benefits because they generate more taxable revenue, whether it's through the official market or through the black market, people are earning. So pe you know, there's more consumer spending. That's what it comes down to. I, could, I can spend. So, does that make sense? It's about economics, really. No, I think that that uh, there are benefits for you, that, and there are also benefits for your employer, uh, uh, because I, I, I think it's 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 particularly important that you can, by the fact that you are working for them, you are able to bring your values and your knowledge and your ability to understand society around you that some that m they might not have. And from, you see, from a national perspective, from, 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 it makes sense that the companies actually sell, and enable flexible working and, 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 and enable and find more jobs that are like this because it supports the, 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 it supports the GDP of the country. Ultimately, the more people that you have who are knocked out of the economy through lack of access, for whatever reason, through glasses, through not flexible working, the country is economically losing out. And as more people are becoming more, have got more access issues, actually the country is going into more deficit. It needs to be, well, that's the reason why we set up partly we can access to literally re, you know, readdress that economic balance and say to employers, it's good to employ people like this because if you employ us, we can buy your products. Does that, yeah? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the economic case is, is, is actually quite clear. The, you know, both for inclusion, but also the, you know, I think we've talked about this before and I certainly bang on about it a lot. You know, exclusion is an externality. We should treat it like pollution. You know, we should be taking those same kind of approaches because it actually it's a, it's a societal cost. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, I need to make sure that we pay our thanks to those that keep us sustainable. You know, our supporters, uh, Barclays Access, Microlink, and, and MyClearText for making us accessible, uh, paying a part to uh, be inclusive in general. Thank you, David, very much. Thanks. And I want to, to also just finally say to everyone that's watching, stay safe because, you know, make sure that you do what's right for you because the disability community is the most at risk. Uh, of this virus that's going around so make sure that you take the care of yourselves 
that you need to do. And yes, disability and aging, while they're interrelated, we all acquire some kind of disability as we get older. And so, yeah, the risk profile of our audience in particular is is pretty high. So, you know, all of you guys, we, you know, we care for you deeply. We will make sure you stay safe. So thank you.